Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. In some Christian uh, traditions, 50 days after Easter is the day of Pentecost. It's the day that the Holy Spirit finally come down and draw upon the disciples and empower them to speak in various language, native language, and proclaim the great doing to various audience from all different kinds of culture in Jerusalem. And traditionally we call today is the birthday of the Christian church. Some churches will also celebrate the new baptized members in the church and welcome them and also review the church ministry in honor of God. Today is also the Pacific Islanders and Asian American Ministry Sunday. Our church has a long history working in this field. And remember, once upon a time, in our church newsletter, that mentioned our church and the Interface Council, we lead a very interesting and important ceremony we call Hiroshima Peace Memorial Ceremony in the Japanese garden just not far away from us, right next to the Museum of Science and Industry. Do we remember those people who suffer and die and the victim of Atmod, the bomb in Japan, to remember they are lost? Every year on August the 6th, in the, in the past several years, we focus on various topics as well, such as the Christian church in South Korea, an incarceration camp during the World War II to against the Japanese American people. And last year, we host the Taiwan's music concert to introduce the Taiwanese cultures by interacting with the audience through the music. We try to do the cross-culture conversations through various events. And today we are fortunate to have the opportunity to learn more about the Christian ministry in India. Is that right slides on the TV? Oh, great. <laughs> I would like to invite uh, Senare again to share with us. Please join me to welcome her. Thank you, Selarin, for sharing uh, this moment of Pentecost with us. The reflection today is, what does this mean? A famous Catholic theologian, Stephen Bevans, lists six models of contextual theology in his book. I believe we can use various lens, he suggests, to read the scripture today the story of the Presbyterian Church in India and what happened in, in the United States and our world. In Sinarin's uh, presentations, Reverend Thomas Jones and his wife Anne Jones were from the Presbyterian Church of Wales. They started to listen uh, attentively to the pronunciation of the local language, Kasi. Kasi? <laughs> Seven or eight months later, Reverend Thomas Jones can preach in Kasi and then use the Roman alphabet to translate those prayer, Gospel of Matthew, into Kasi. So people can start to read the scripture in their own language. And Reverend Thomas Jones even recognized, but he was recognized as a founder of Kasi literature. Isn't it amazing? a foreigner become a founder of literature in local lands. Back to the model of the contextual theology. We may call this trans transla translation or translational model, which focus in translating the Bible into the local language, use the local terms to let the people understand, oh, this term means what's in this scripture. And the people can start to read, understand the scripture from their own language and their own culture. 
the missionaries from Wales to India, they might also need to consider another approach called the anthropological model, who use the local culture the element to represent what the mean of God, salvation, or what is the meaning of sin or redeemer. It's a very interesting project for the missionaries, not only to different culture, different country, but also across different communities, maybe to surround us. They also might be able to explain why 75% of the populations there, they are practicing Christianity. And today, our first reading today is from Psalm 104. It's an interesting psalm to us to know. We also can try to understand this psalm in one of the model translation. This psalm is talking about the Spirit of God is a sustainer of everything, every creation, every creatures, creatures among us, not only on the, uh, in, on, the, on the land, but also in the ocean. Every creatures, they are supported by God's Spirit and breath. But when we look carefully about Psalm 104, verse 26, there's an interesting term there in our Bible. He called Livianthan. 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 Livianthan was English, but originally it from Hebrew called Livayadan. If you check out the dictionary, the other dictionary, we will tell you Livayadan means a sea monster or a dragon or a large aquatic animal or perhaps is extinct dinosaur. What does that mean in the Bible? How could people at that time know dinosaur? I, I do not understand. But the same words will also appear in the book of Job in chapter 41 saying, Job talked to God, can you draw out Leviathan with the fish hook, fish hook? and press down his tongue with the cord. Can you fish that creature from the ocean? Which means it's impossible to do so. In the Jewish Bible, the commentary will say that, mm, traditionally we understand this creature is a beloved of the deity El. El's pets of El, a plaything from the Ugaritic language and the literature from 16th to 12th century BCE. So people understand this tiny creature in the ocean is a pet of the divine El. It's a pet. So they also understand this kind of creature always escort a ship in the ocean. So what kind of animal in the ocean escort the ship and swimming around the ship? That must be dolphins. So they understand the dolphin in the oceans as called a ship. When we approach, when we sail on the ocean, God's messenger, God's path is swimming around you to guide your path. It's the spirit also in that a creature, the dolphin. But in different cultures, we have quite different understanding, isn't it? I'll raise two interesting translation modes in different Bibles. In some Mandarin or Chinese Bible, this creature was named alligator. We all, my first time to see these creatures in Florida, the old sign on the street, if you see alligator, please stay away from them. They are dangerous creatures. Do not touch them. Do not pat their head. But in the Chinese Bible, it translates into the Alligator is a dangerous creature compared to dolphin and alligator. What does that mean? When people read the Psalm 104 in Chinese Bible, they will, feel, they will fear this kind of creature dangerous. We should keep away from them. And from some, um, one of the uh, popular Taiwanese Bible, the creature was translated into 
a big fish. Interesting, right? For me as a Taiwanese, my first time see the alligator is in the zoo. We cannot see anything else outside the zoo have alligator anywhere. We can't. But we know there are lots of big fish like dolphins or whales. <laughs> whales will be in the ocean. So when we translate the Bible into different culture, what kind of term we should pick to let the people understand the scripture and the creation of God is quite a challenge. But however, right now, most of the Bible, they leave the term as it is. Do not use the other term to describe it. Just leave the term, similar with the Hebrew pronunciation, Yivayakam, in our Bible. The development of the translation into alligator or big fish or keep the unknown figure may also be an example of the synthetic model which emphasizes the, com the conversation and dialogue between the translation and local culture, try to figure out a better way to express what has written in the Bible. It's very common right now in our ministry. So using the wrong word in other culture might bring a quite different cultural understanding, even will bring the harm or rejections. The cross-culture ministry is very difficult, but we have the wisdom to do so. Another interesting and typical challenge is how could you un let people understand God, Adonai, Adonai? How, what kind of turn you want to introduce to your audience speak different language, then understand this refers to God. Would that be the Native American's culture calling them the Gaia would be the God? Or could that be a very strong political leader that could be God? What happened in our country, unfortunately. Or it may be one of the native deity we can use the name to represent our God. The Jewish people, they are very good at this, right? They use El, the Most High God, and Shaddai, the Almighty God. They put together the Most High, the Almighty God, El Shaddai, become the name of Adonai, Adonai. The name keep developing in different cultures, even in the Jewish culture. And we might also be familiar with another model called the practice model, which focuses on the liberation for the oppressed and marginalized people. After Martin Luther King Jr., we have known that racial justice is part of the mission of our church. However, theologian Stephen Bevans also mentioned for most of the time, the Christian church, we do not follow any of them. We love to use another model called the counterculture model, which enforces the audience to receive whatever we know, whatever we believe, whatever our Jesus looks like, or whatever what God looks like for us, what we have experienced for them. This model may not agree with any normal norms from different cultures, any value from different cultures, they have unified everything into one single culture by reading the Bible and the Gospel. Today, we can read from the second scripture today from the book of Acts. There was another example applying the different model today. At the end of the Gospel of Luke, if we treat Gospel of Luke is a prequel of the book of Acts. The disciple and Jesus' follower, they were lost. They felt lost when Jesus was gone. The follower met the resurrected Jesus on the way, but they cannot recognize him. And they need to gather together in a room privately. They always feel uncertain, even when the Jesus appeared among them. They feel terrified. What's going on? They assume they, they have, they have seen a ghost among them. 
It's the context of them. They do not feel free. They feel terrified. We may call them, they are religious refugees. They are oppressed from different religious leaders at that time. This kind of context, not only in the first century, but also in our current context. Recently, a football player spoke at a college graduation ceremony, which unfortunately is also a Catholic school. In his speech, he mentioned that he said to the audience at the ceremony, graduations, especially to the female students, point out to them, you should be the good wife at home. Being a good housewife, your job, your, your best job, and you should have kids as, more, as much as you can. The football player also mentioned, we, in our country, there are a lot of dangerous gender ideologies. They will do our harms. He against LGBT rights. He also mentioned women cannot decide what they want for their body or to keep the children or not. He also criticized only the men can decide on abortion topic. His speech is basically filled with mis uh, misogyny, misogyny, patriarchy, and homophobia, LGBT phobia. I think most of us have heard these tragedies on news. But surprisingly, even the Fox News have an interesting interview the same day. It's a quote. The interview saying, that person, that ethics, religious outlook is being compared to the cult-like extremist religions in the Middle East, and recommending he to go to the therapist. Even Fox News saying that this person something wrong with him to see a therapist. But he, uh, he used his Catholic understanding to force his ideology to a lot of young people just graduate that day. Not only the therapist needed by this football player. How about Benjamin Netanyahu, who enforced his Zionist ideology upon the Palestinians and the war in Gaza? Two weeks ago was one of the important festival for the Jewish traditions, the Passover. We read the book of Exodus. Let my people go. God hear that and ask the Pharaoh, let my people go. Let them be free. Benjamin Netanyahu saying the same thing to Hamas, let my people go or I will kill you more. He's saying Hamas is the Pharaoh and the Jewish people, they are suffering. Theologian can describe this Zionism ideology force the oppressed people still under that kind of circumstance. They are far away from liberation and the love of God. In this context, women, LGBT people, and people in Gaza are also religious refugees. They were tortured and silenced by the deviation from the religious cult and the ideology. These two examples are the counterculture model examples in our current time. I'm afraid their God definitely is not my God, although we might read the same Hebrew Bible or most of the same Hebrew Bible. However, on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit gives the oppressed disciples, we can call them religious refugees, courage. The Bible tells us that the disciples start to speak in various tongues, not only to themselves, but to a quite different group of people. People at that time heard they were speaking about God's deed of power. What does this mean? People at that time, they were amazed and perplexed. What does that mean? How can they speak in our tongue? Use the right term 
to describe God's great job and great work among people. The core message is the same, based on the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who was born of love for everyone. This message was translated in different languages from different cultures, using the right term. The message is about unconditional love and salvation within the existing cultures. That day, 3,000 people were baptized in the name of Jesus. Also, apparently, after that day, if they are no longer a small group, they cannot pray and gather in the private room. There are 3,000 people. They need to pray and gather in public. They need the courage to do so, and God has given them the courage to do so. The same spirit in the psalm, Ruach, the, the sustainer of the creatures, is also the same Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, Aigos Pneumas. It was translated from different understanding in different languages, but people can understand what that means. It means the Spirit of God. In the book of Acts, the figure of the Spirit was transformed into the tongue of fire and spread upon the disciples' head. It's quite vivid. People can understand because of the Spirit just died the fire of tongue. People right now was encouraged to speak a fire of tongue in various language to different people. Reverend Paul Dietrich shared with us early this month, saying that the United States is now the fear of missions from outside this country. Christians from outside the United States come here, share their thoughts. Today, we have Sinarines and me share their thoughts and understand of Christianity with the people who live in this country. Some of us may be the leader of our church and denomination in this country because we are trying to bring our church to a more diverse and fuller body of Christ. It's my privilege to stand here today and do not take it for granted. The early missionaries lied in Sinarin's country. They were from Church of Scotland and Church of Canada from the 19th century to Taiwan, 1960s. 160 years later, I'm here sharing the message received from my teacher, minister, and Christian friends. This message must be transformed in different ways many times. Today, we are here to share with each other, to encourage each other. The message across the boundary and the cultural barrier is an unconditional love of Jesus Christ. For St. Irene's hometown, 75% of people practice Christianity. It's a great testimony of Pentecost. It's quite amazing. And today, we should feel the same and strong faith among us we will also see a great transformation power among us to transform our neighborhood, our community, and our country, and all around the world. Everyone will know your God is gracious God, a God with love. We want to follow that God. We want to be the children of that God. When we celebrate that diversity among us, on the Pacific Island and the Asian American Ministry Sunday and the Pentecost. What kind of model we can use to proclaim the message to various culture and audience among us? Reverend Thomas Jones listened to the Kashi language, become a founder of the Kashi literature. The disciples spoke in various native tongues and people were amazed and perplexed. That day, 3,000 people, they baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. There are still lots of opportunity for us 
to proclaim the gospel. We use our wisdom, we all use our stories among us, and then we can continue to do the good job. May the Holy Spirit come, give us courage, and inspire us all. Amen. <laughs>